All right, let's get started. Welcome to Material Science and Engineering 405, Physics of Solids. My name is Mark Hurston. I'll be the instructor for this quarter. I'd like to begin by introducing myself and then introducing the TAs for the course. Uh, so I'll give you a brief autobiography. I grew up in Downers Grove, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, about 45 minute drive from here. Attended Downers Grove South High School and then went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign for a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Following my time in Urbana, I then went to Argonne National Laboratory where I worked in the energy technology and material science divisions on surface acoustic wave based sensors trying to detect inert gases such as helium. Following that, I attended the University of Cambridge in the UK where I studied physics at the Cavendish Laboratory. And in Cambridge, the way that they study physics is a little different than here in that I took 10 courses and a course there consisted of literally four one hour lectures from a professor and a book list with as many as 10 to 15 books on that book list. And then we had about six months to go back to our dorms, learn the material and then show up at the end of the spring quarter to demonstrate our knowledge of that material. So there was very little feedback, no homework assignments, no hour exams, only this large cumulative final exam, and that's where I learned solid state physics. So I'm essentially self-taught, or at least taught in the Cambridge style. So you're going to be hearing my take on solid state physics in this course. Following my time in Cambridge, I then attended the University of Illinois again, uh, pursuing a PhD in electrical engineering at the Beckman Institute which is a multidisciplinary research institute in Urbana. Uh, my committee consisted of material science, electrical engineering, chemistry, and physics faculty, so the training was quite diverse. And as a result, uh, when I graduated, I had a couple of options in front of me, and I chose to come here to Northwestern. Incidentally, during my PhD, I spent some time at IBM TJ Watson Research Center, where I was working with Dr. Faye Navoris on multi-wall carbon nanotube charge transport. So that's my background. For the past six years, I've been here at Northwestern. And this is the first time I've taught this particular course. However, I have taught the undergraduate version of this course many times, and also the follow-on course, Material Science and Engineering 451, several times. So I'm trying to target this course somewhere in the middle. So that's my background. Uh, I'll now introduce Nathan Yoder, who's one of the TAs for the course. All right, um, so my name is Nathan Yoder. I'm a fifth year material science uh, graduate student in the Hurston Group, and um, I did my undergrad at Purdue University in the material and uh, did that for four years, and I've been here for four years as well. So I primarily work with the uh, UHV IBM and uh, work on cryogenic uh, studies of stability of organic molecules. Um, I've taken both this course and the follow-up course 451, and I've also TA'd uh, 451, so hopefully uh, both myself and Dave Comstock, who's the other TA, will be uh, available to help out. Um, and we've got office hours twice each. All three of us have office hours uh, each week for two hours, so we'll try and make ourselves available for um, assisting you guys and anything. So. Feel free to contact us. Um, obviously, we would like it uh, as much as possible if you could uh, bring your questions to office hours and not, you know, bother us at all hours of the night. But uh, we are available, and um, should be a fun semester. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other TA is Dave Comstock. Dave is also a graduate student in my group, and he is actually split between three locations: Evanston campus the Chicago campus where we have an atomic force microscope that he utilizes in his research and also Argonne National Laboratory where he does a variety of thin film deposition techniques. So today he's at Argonne, so he couldn't be here. Uh, but he'll come tomorrow and you'll get to uh, meet him. And all of us have office hours, as Nathan mentioned. I finally want to introduce John Ireland, who's the man behind the camera. John's a postdoc uh, in my group. Uh, he's part of the National Center for Learning and Teaching uh, which is focusing on nanoscale science and engineering education. Part of that program is to try to establish 
gather and disseminate content in the area of nanoscale science and engineering. Clearly, quantum mechanics and solid state physics are foundation concepts for nanotechnology. And as a result, all of my courses have been videotaped in the past. They're all available on the internet, in fact. So if you're interested in seeing previous lectures from Material Science and Engineering 351, or 451 for that matter, they're available at any time. And as a result, since we've never taught 405 before, we're going to be videotaping it. So I try to make the videotape uh, have as little impact as possible on our interaction in class. I don't speak to the camera. I will happily take your questions at any time. Uh, so my first priority is to you. But we want to have this experience documented uh, for that purpose. And also for you, if you want to go back and view a lecture, you'll be able to do that. Or if you miss class, you can view the lecture at your leisure. You should have in front of you a several handouts, and I'd just like to go over them each uh, to get the bureaucracy out of the way, and then we can jump right into the heart of the matter, which is quantum mechanics, our first topic. The first sheet I'm looking at is the course description. It says physics of solids at the top. It includes some details on where to find me, and my office hours Wednesday, 2 to 4 p.m. One thing you notice is that this course is offered five days a week, nominally, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 1 o'clock in this room. However, as you'll see in the syllabus in a minute, uh, there have already been 10 of these classes canceled. Uh, the reason why I did this is that I have to travel a lot, and by reserving this room five days a week, I don't have to worry about rescheduling other rooms, trying to find a time when we're all available. Basically, we'll meet whenever I'm in town, and we'll be able to meet the 35 to 40 lecture hour standard for this course. In the past, this has been a four uh, class per week, 10 week long course. So right now we have 40 lectures, uh, four lecture, 40 lecture hours available to us. I think we could probably cut a couple of those. If I have to go out of town, we'll do that. Otherwise, if we get ahead, I'll just cancel class. So stay tuned to those cancellations. They're all in the syllabus for what I know at this point. The description of the course is Introduction to Quantum Mechanics and Solid State Physics. And specific topics include free electron behavior, potential energy wells and barriers, energy band theory, phonons, and electrical properties of metals and semiconductors. This course is one uh, which has been historically difficult to teach because the backgrounds of incoming graduates to our department vary significantly. Some of you may have been physicists as undergraduates and already had quantum mechanics and solid state physics at a level as high or even higher than this course. If you think that is the case after seeing a couple lectures and seeing the syllabus, seeing the textbooks, then let me know. Uh, you can exempt out of this course and move directly to 451, which we taught in the spring. Some of you may be chemists or material scientists at a university where quantum mechanics was not required. And you may have never heard of quantum mechanics or seen the Schrodinger equation before. If that's the case, then you have a couple of options. One is to drop this course, take 351 in the winter, which I'll be teaching, and that starts from no knowledge of quantum mechanics and builds you up to this level, and then take 405 next fall. And this will not delay graduation or anything. There's no negative consequence if you fall into that category. Or if you don't want to do that and you want to try 405, then as I mentioned, 351, every lecture note, every video lecture, all the homework, is available online, and you may want to look at the appropriate lectures from 351 before coming to 405 for that week. If you look at the syllabi for 351 and 405, you'll see that they're essentially the same. Obviously, in 405, we're going to be treating quantum mechanics and solid state physics at a higher level and moving more quickly. But if, for example, you're weak in three-dimensional solution to the Schrodinger equation, you could review those lectures from 351 and then come to 405 and probably be able to keep up. Uh, that's up to you. It's basically your decision. If you want to talk to me further about it, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but basically, you can go home and drop this course if you feel you're too advanced or would like to review 351 before moving on. Are there any questions or concerns about that issue? OK. If not, if we keep going through this sheet, you'll see the teaching method roughly are an average four 50-minute lectures per week. There'll be discussion, lectures, 
homework exams, and you'll see on the syllabus how many there are. There's six, one midterm and one final exam. Your grades will be determined from your homework, midterm, and the final. The textbooks are Griffith's Quantum Mechanics book. The second edition is out. If you have the first edition, that's probably fine, but you should probably find someone who has a second edition to compare what the differences are. In particular, if I were to assign a homework problem from this book, it may not be the exact same number as in the first edition. The second book is Introduction to Solid State Physics by Cattell. The eighth edition is out. Some of you may have the seventh or the sixth or the second edition, depending upon where you got your copy. Again, you'd want to compare someone who has the eighth edition to see if there's where the changes are, in particular with the homework problems. All these books are also on reserve in the library, so you could go there to check uh, if necessary. If we move on to the next sheet, uh, which are the course policies, uh, communication is done via the web page, and I'll be going through the web page in a minute. This is on the course management system, also known as Blackboard. There's also a link to this page from my research group's web page, and I put that address here, so you should be able to find it. Um, you can also contact us, us being the course instructors, me, Nathan, and Dave, by email or in class uh, to schedule individual appointments or, of course, come to office hours. There's homework assignments, roughly one per week. You'll see it's a little less than that. There are six throughout the quarter, and it's a ten-week quarter. Um, because the quarter is short at Northwestern, we cannot accept late homework because if you fall behind, there's no catching up, basically. So you need to turn your homework in in class on the days that it's due on the syllabus. The homework sets and then the solutions after uh, you guys have turned them in will be posted so you can view the solutions online. Collaboration on homework is allowed and encouraged if you're someone who learns better in a group environment. However, uh, you each need to submit a copy of the homework solutions in your own handwriting. So you shouldn't take the assignment, split it up into parts, of it and then photocopy it and staple it together. You should each actually write it out, but if you want to collaborate in, in determining the solution, that's of course allowed. But please list your collaborators at the top of the homework assignment so we know what collaboration is occurring and there's no suspicion of uh, any untoward activity. Exams, there's two exams, a midterm and a final. On the midterm, you'll be allowed a calculator, a ruler, and one 8.5 by 11 sheet of notes you can write on both sides as small as you want. Uh, there's reasons why I do this, and I'll come back to that later on when the exams show up. For the final, you get two sheets of these notes. I would recommend you take the sheet from the first exam and then create a second one for the second half of the course, bring those both to the final exam. There may or may not be review sessions. If we get ahead, we'll just have the review sessions in class. If we need more time or there's enough interest, we can have sessions the night before or a couple nights before the exams. I already talked about grades. Textbooks. The last concern which many students have about this course in particular in many of the graduate level courses in our department is the level of mathematics which is required and expected of you. With that said, I'm recommending strongly if you have any concern to get a couple of these Shams outline books. They literally cost eight or nine bucks on Amazon. I've listed them uh, on this course policies sheet. Basically, how I think about these is it's like if, you're, if you speak Spanish or you learn Spanish in high school and then you go to Spain to actually speak it, you're probably going to bring with you a phrase book and a Spanish-English dictionary to help you through because not everything's fresh in your mind. These handbooks are similar. You probably have had multivariable calculus, differential equations, vector calculus in the past, but it may not be fresh in your mind. These books will point you in the direction of exactly what identity you will need for a particular problem. So that's one way to deal with this uh, lack of, of mathematics on the tip of your tongue. That's just a piece of advice. None of this is required, of course. In addition, I've put 10 books on reserve. That's the next sheet. Uh, you can read these as well as I can. Uh, they're in the engineering library. Hopefully all of you have figured out where the engineering library is. It's directly north of Cook Hall. Uh, the engineering library has these books, and there are books which I find to be relevant to this course. So if you're having trouble with a particular concept, for example, phonons, you may want to go to a different book if Cattell doesn't do a good job, in your opinion, of explaining that concept. The last sheet is the syllabus. 
Uh, the syllabus lists uh, many useful things, including when the office hours are. I already mentioned mine are Wednesdays, 2 to 4. Or, of course, you can schedule an appointment with me if that time doesn't work. Dave Comstock's office hours are Thursdays, 10 to 12. And his office hours will be held in 2068 Cook Hall, which is Material Science and Engineering Teaching Lab. Uh, I think most of you probably know where that is. Nathan Yoder's office hours are Fridays, 2 to 4, in the same location, 20, 2068 Cook Hall, the Material Science and Engineering Teaching Lab. Incidentally, if my office hours become very popular and we can't accommodate the number of students that show up in my office, then we'll move up to the teaching lab as well. So go there if I'm not in my office during office hours. I mentioned the grading, the textbooks. Here you can see the specific topics and when the homeworks are due. You see that there's six due dates for the homework. The exam will occur on two days, and this is kind of unusual. Uh, in the past, I've had many complaints that my exams are too long or there's not enough time for the exam. One way to deal with that is to schedule, let's say, a two-hour session at night and give you a one-hour exam two -hour time period, but that becomes problematic with schedules. So what I've done is given you two days to do the first exam. We'll do them both in class. And what I'll do is split the exam in half, and you'll do the first half on day one and the second half on day two. Uh, this means that you'll have an hour to do a half hour, what I would deem to be a half hour's long exam. So hopefully time will not be an issue in that case. It'll also give you a chance to take a break, I suppose, halfway through the exam and, and regroup. Um, if you look at the topics, the first half of the course is basically covering the Schrodinger equation and introductory quantum theory. That includes the Schrodinger equation in one dimension, Schrodinger equation in three dimensions, and then approximation methods, including perturbation theory and variational principle. Then we'll have the first exam, which will basically cover quantum mechanics. The second half of the course covers solid state physics. We'll begin with the simplest theory of solid state physics, which is free electron theory. We'll then establish that free electron theory is uh, inherently flawed and does not include many other concepts which are important for solids, including phonons, including band structure. And once we know those three concepts, we'll talk specifically about semiconductors, which are an interesting case uh, which we'll study in this course. You'll see that there's absolutely no class during Thanksgiving week, so that whole week is off. Uh, and there's other dates which are canceled, which are listed here. The final exam will be in this room on December 7th, which is our scheduled time. I'm starting the exam one hour early at 8 to 11, so you have plenty of time to do the exam. It'll not only be a two-hour exam, but you'll have three hours to do it. Any questions on anything? Okay. The last bureaucratic detail I want to cover is the course web page. I think many of you have seen these Blackboard web pages before. Basically, all the action is on the left-hand side here. If you want any course information, you can see everything I just handed out to you. Staff information has our information, how to contact us, when our office hours are, etc. Course documents have all the lecture notes. So, for example, you could download today's lecture notes if you want. I'll try my best to keep these updated and preferably loaded before class. You can print them out before class. I can't promise that'll happen every time, but I'll, I'll try my best. The assignments will be listed here. Obviously, it's not in there yet, but homework one will be there and the solutions after how uh, you've turned them in. Finally, uh, external links. The only external link I have right now is to Material Science and Engineering 351.1, which takes you to this NCLT webpage. And if you click here, you'll get into the course. And you need to understand or realize that the course materials are up here in the upper right-hand corner. So if you click there, then you can go in and say go to week two of that course, get the lecture notes, and then download the videos if you want. Everything's there. In addition, the homework assignments are there as well. So if you feel weak on a particular topic we're covering in class, you felt like your undergraduate training was not sufficient, you could go here, learn at least how I teach the undergraduate version, um, and then hopefully catch up uh, with the rest of the class. Okay. All right, any other questions, or any questions any of you have? All right, either I'm being very clear or uh, you're a little shy. I'm not sure which. But what I'll say is uh, throughout the course, I encourage questions. I hope you'll ask them if I'm being unclear. Uh, if I'm not getting 
questions, then I'll assume I'm going too slowly and I'll start to pick up the pace. So if you feel like I'm going too quickly, just ask a question and you'll slow me down. <laughs> okay. Another thing that I, I tend to do is utilize the Blackboard for a course like this. Uh, students tend to like that because it slows me down a little as well. Um, if my handwriting is illegible or you can't read it, just speak up and I'll clarify. Okay. So if you look at the schedule, this first week is an introduction, if you will. It's basically covering chapter one of Griffiths. And chapter one of Griffiths introduces the wave function and quantum theory. In this course, I'm not going to give you the long-winded history of quantum mechanics, where it come from, where the, Schrodinger, where the Schrodinger equation came from, et cetera. That's all in the 351. First two weeks of that course is devoted to establishing quantum mechanics, how it came to be. So if you don't know that history or are interested in that history, you could view that. Here we're just going to jump right into it because I'm assuming you've seen this before to some extent. It's made mostly a review. So before we talk about quantum mechanics, let's talk about classical physics. And then we'll be able to pinpoint the differences between classical physics and quantum physics and uh, talk about some of the fundamental uh, physics problems and philosophical problems with quantum theory. So in classical physics, a typical problem that you would face is to consider a particle. Of mass m in one dimension. Subjected to a force. Capital F. Since we're in one dimension, we only have to worry about one spatial coordinate x. But of course, this could vary as a function of time as well, which is a second degree of freedom. Another way of constructing this problem is to say the mass is in a potential V, and the force then would be the partial of V with respect to x, the negative of that quantity. The objective in a problem like this, or the goal, is to find the particle, its position at all future values of time, assuming you knew where it was and its initial velocity. We should be able to determine x at all future values of time. To solve this problem, we go to the fundamental equations of classical physics, which are Newton's laws, and in particular, Newton's second law is relevant here. Newton's second law is you probably recall is that F equals MA, F is the force, A is acceleration. In other words, if we were to express this in terms of the potential, the potential, or the force in terms of the potential is the negative partial with respect to X. So V is the potential. Mass is M, and acceleration is the second time derivative of position. where V is the potential energy. So this equation, Newton's second law, plus two initial conditions, which will typically be the position x at t equals zero, the initial position, and the velocity at t equals zero, that is the first derivative of x with respect to time at t equals zero. If we have this equation in two initial conditions, then we can uniquely determine x for all future values of time. We can see that just by inspection of the differential equation. It's a second order differential equation, so you need two boundary conditions to solve a second order differential equation. This uniquely Are these uniquely determine x. And of course, once x is known, then we can calculate many other parameters of interest. So with x, we can calculate parameters such as velocity, which is just dx dt. Momentum, 
Once you know the velocity, we know the momentum. P, which is just mass times velocity. Could calculate the kinetic energy. T, which is one half mv squared, etc. The bottom line and the take-home message is that classical physics is deterministic. If we know the initial conditions and the potential, we know everything for future values of time. So classical physics is deterministic. Any questions thus far on classical physics? This you probably learned in high school or something. It's something we're very comfortable with because our everyday observations are consistent with classical physics. So our intuition is firmly grounded in these concepts. So that's classical physics. Let's contrast it with quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics approaches this problem. So it's the same problem as before. A particle of mass m in one dimension subjected to a potential v, or a force f. It approaches this problem via the one dimensional, since we're in 1D here, Schrodinger equation. And this is where, hopefully, uh, you've seen this equation before. If not, if you haven't seen this equation before, I would strongly recommend you take 351. The Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent one-dimensional Schrodinger equation is I h bar, first partial of psi with respect to time, is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m, second partial of psi with respect to x, plus V, the potential, times psi. And if you had taken a course like 351, you will recall that IH bar, second partial, or first partial with respect to T, is the energy operator. So the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy operator in quantum mechanics is minus H bar squared over 2M times the second partial with respect to X, at least in one dimension, plus the potential energy V. So you could, you could think of the Schrodinger equation as a statement of conservation of energy. Total energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. But of course, there's this mysterious value, capital Psi, which we have to address. What is this capital Psi? Incidentally, I, in this course, be square root of negative 1. If you're an electrical engineer, you may have seen this called J before, since I is reserved for current in electrical engineering. But here, we'll uh, use I. H bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, which is 1.054572 times 10 to the minus 34 joules dot seconds. Okay. This is Planck's constant. In psi, which is what we're going to be addressing today, is the particle's wave function. If we're given an initial condition, so if we knew psi at t equals zero, then this equation tells us what psi will be for all future values of time. So in that sense, it's similar to Classical physics, we need an initial condition, we have some equation, we can solve it to learn some properties of the particle for all future values of time. So given some initial conditions, so if we prepared our experiment such that we knew where the particle was, or at least we knew what its wave function was at t equals zero, 
And we knew the potential. We could then solve this And the Schrodinger equation will give us the wave function at all future values of time. So I think we can see that by inspection. If we accept this as an equation, if we have an initial condition, we could certainly solve it and find the wave function for all future values of time. That's, of course, what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks is solving this exactly for some very special potentials and then learning ways to solve it in general using some approximation techniques. But this is, of course, dodging the fundamental question of what is the wave function. Okay. So there's a famous interpretation of the wave function by Born. This is Born's statistical interpretation. Born says that psi itself has no meaning. In fact, the magnitude squared of psi has no meaning. But an integral of magnitude squared of psi over some region in space does have physical meaning. By that, I mean if we were to take an integral, a definite integral between a and b of the magnitude squared of psi dx, that this is equal to the probability of finding the particle between points A and B at time t. Okay. So magnitude squared of psi, an integral of that over some region in space, tells us the probability of locating the particle. It doesn't tell us anything about where the particle is, per se. It says what the probability is of finding the particle at some region in space. I should point out that psi in general is a complex function. And as a result, the magnitude squared of psi can be calculated by taking the complex conjugate of psi times psi. So this star means complex conjugate. Quantum mechanics is a relatively thorough exam of your previous mathematics. If you're uncomfortable with complex numbers, you could open up Shom's outline to complex numbers chapter and recall some of these tricks. If you're uncomfortable with integrals, go to the integral section. If you're uncomfortable with differential equations, go to the diff EQ section. You really need to know uh, all math uh, in order to handle quantum mechanics. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but you need to know a lot of math to handle quantum mechanics. So let's draw an example wave function. Actually, I'm going to draw the magnitude squared of some hypothetical wave function. Because it's a magnitude squared, we know it has to be a positive real value function. So we have to draw something above uh, the x-axis here. So let's say we have some function which looks like this. And let's say this is point A and that's point B then the probability of locating the particle between those two points is the area under the curve. Okay, that's just a restatement of this uh, mathematical equation. We could label some other critical points. For example, this peak here, we'll call that A. We'll call this point here B, capital B, and this point capital C. Obviously, just looking at this eyeballing it, we can see that the probability of locating the particle near A would be relatively high because there's a peak in the magnitude squared of the wave function. The probability of locating the particle near point B would be relatively small because the wave function in magnitude squared is approximately zero. C would be somewhere in between. So just by eyeballing the wave function, or at least the magnitude squared of the wave function, we can know something about where the particle is likely to be found. Any questions so far? Incidentally, when you're in three dimensions, you obviously have to do a three-dimensional integral. You have to multiply by the volume differential. So for example, if you're in spherical coordinates, the volume differential is r squared sine theta dr 
d theta d phi. And as a result, if you want to eyeball where the particle is likely to be located, you can't just plot the magnitude squared of psi, but if you want to know where it was, for example, as a function of r, you have to plot r squared times the magnitude squared of psi, because the probability is a function of the magnitude squared of the wave function times the differential volume element, which has an r squared term in it there. That's a very typical error which is made uh, in introductory quantum theory. Uh, that is number one problem that's incorrect on the first exam in 351. So I'm just pointing that out. Uh, probably a refresher for you. Okay, so you can see clearly that the area under this curve is the probably locating the particle between A and B. A is a greater probability than B. C is somewhere in between. The point here is that we're not saying exactly where the particle is. We're giving a statistical description of where it is likely to find the particle. And as a result, that's why this is called the statistical interpretation. And the statistical interpretation now is very different from classical physics, which I just erased. Remember, classical physics was a deterministic theory. This theory of quantum mechanics has an inherent indeterminacy. We don't know exactly where the particle is for all values of time. We just know the likelihood of finding it at some particular value of time when we perform a measurement. If we were to perform a measurement on a large ensemble of particles which should all have been prepared in the same way and allowed to evolve for the same period of time in the same potential, then we'd be able to build up a distribution of locations which would match the wave function. So it describes the result of many, many measurements, thousands, millions of measurements, as opposed to what will happen for a particular measurement. Which then begs the question, if we take a measurement and we find the particle to be at point C, where was the particle immediately preceding that measurement? Okay. So suppose the particle position is measured to be C. Where was the particle immediately preceding the measurement? This, you could argue, is the most hotly debated uh, question in quantum mechanics. And there's three schools of thought. There's not a answer, so to speak. The first school of thought is known as the realist position. So the realist, if they were asked, where was the particle immediately preceding the measurement, the realist would say, well, of course the particle was at point C immediately preceding the measurement. That's where it was. When we measured it, it must have been there right before the measurement. So the realist would answer the particle was at C. This is the stance taken by Einstein. Einstein did not believe in physical theories which were indeterminate. He famously stated that God does not play dice. He does not believe that physical theories are like going to Vegas and betting. It's not something which we can only know probabilistically, something we should know definitely. So this is Einstein's position. And his famous quote, God doesn't play dice. So, you know, Einstein's a relatively respected figure in physics, so you think this stance would uh, be relatively largely accepted. Incidentally, uh, this stance is not very well accepted nowadays. Einstein went to his grave believing this, seeking for some correction to quantum mechanics, which would remove 
this statistical interpretation and did not find it. I should point out that if Einstein is correct or if the realist position is correct, then obviously the Schrodinger equation and therefore the wave function is not the whole story. Something is missing and this something is often known as the hidden variable. So there must be some hidden variable which removes this statistical interpretation. No one has found this hidden variable. Uh, if you find it, I promise the Nobel Prize is waiting for you. The second position is known as the orthodox position. So the orthodox position, remember what question we're answering, where was the particle immediately preceding the measurement? The orthodox position would say, the particle wasn't anywhere. This position is also known as the Copenhagen interpretation. The way to think about this position is that the measurement itself induces the particle to take a stand, to assume a position. So the measurement forces the particle to take a stand. This, although it sounds kind of far-fetched uh, when you first hear it, is the most popular position taken by most physicists today. And historically, it was famously taken by Bohr. Bohr and Einstein argued about this uh, at length neither relenting. So this is the most widely accepted position. Of course, these questions are difficult to prove. And as a result, it's fodder for debate. questions so far? Okay, so what's the third school of thought? Like any religious or philosophical debate, you always have those who refuse to take a stand, also known as the agnostic position. The agnostic position is to refuse to answer that question. And the agnostic would say that it is metaphysics or philosophy to worry about something that is impossible to test. Obviously, there's no way we can know what happened immediately preceding a measurement. We have to measure to see what happened preceding the measurement. So it's a philosophical discussion. And as a result, we're not going to worry ourselves with these questions significantly in this course. Uh, you may want to choose a position. Uh, it's perfectly fine if we accept the agnostic position. Because in this course, what we're going to attempt to do is develop a theory which explains experimental observations. That's all a theory is anyway. Theories come and go. 
Uh, Newton's laws were obviously amended in the early part of the 20th century. Quantum mechanics is a new theory in the early part of the 20th century, and quantum mechanics itself may fall in our lifetimes with a new theory which better describes reality. Uh, that's, I suppose, my take on it and how we're going to approach it in this course. But I want to make you aware of the debate uh, because it's an interesting one and one which is a good thing to talk about over a beer or something like that. Okay. One other thing that, which happened in 1964, which is relevant to this conversation, is a guy by the name of Bell developed a theorem. And Bell's theorem states that there is a measurable difference between the realist and the orthodox positions. Bell's theorem is relatively complicated. It's, it's described briefly in the appendix of Griffiths if you want to read more about it. The point I want to make about Bell's theorem is that experiments have overwhelm, overwhelmingly confirmed the orthodox position, and as a result, that's why it's most widely accepted today. I should point out that some people refuse to accept Bell's theorem. Uh, one of my professors at the University of Illinois uh, is still fighting to this day to disprove Bell's theorem. He doesn't accept it. It's difficult to disprove, however. Other people will take more exotic interpretations which get around Bell's theorem, assuming that there's some non-local hidden variable, for example, in another universe, uh, which can somehow resolve this controversy. These are known as many worlds theories. Uh, these are more and more exotic. Uh, to me, it's easier to assume the agnostic position than to argue there's multiple universes uh, that we have no other knowledge of. But that's up to you to assume your own opinion on this matter. What is known, though, without debate, is what happens if you take a second measurement immediately following the first. So what if a second measurement immediately follows the first? Everyone agrees that the particle remains at point C. And the way to understand this is to say that the act of measurement changes the wave function discontinuously. And in particular, the wave function collapses upon measurement So remember before I drew this, this uh, hypothetical wave function which had some humps and wiggles in it, the wave function after measurement, magnitude squared, is a function of x, now will collapse and be something like a Dirac delta function at c. So if you, if you measure it immediately again, obviously the only place you can find it is at point c. If, however, you waited some period of time and this particle was in a potential, it would continue to evolve according to the Schrodinger equation, and this wave function would begin to spread out and move, et cetera, according to the potential that you have. At some later point in time, it would agree with what the Schrodinger equation would tell you, assuming this was the new initial condition. What's problematic about this is that now there are two different uh, types of physical processes in quantum systems. Those which are, quote, ordinary processes, it's a potential which the particle feels, and it evolves according to uh, following the Schrodinger equation. And then there are measurements which discontinuously collapse the wave function to a particular point where the measurement found the particle to be. The difference between a measurement and an ordinary physical process is something which is difficult to define precisely. And so for our purposes, we'll assume a measurement is something which occurs in the laboratory using an oscilloscope or a detector, a sensor. 
That we're going to define as a measurement. However, if the particle just existed in an electric field, for example, or in the Coulomb potential of a proton, for example, an electron, and the Coulomb potential of a proton, that we would deem to be an ordinary process, and as a result, it would follow the Schrodinger equation. Okay, that's where I'd like to stop today. Are there any final questions or concerns? If not, we will continue tomorrow. See you here. <laughs>